going to ask both Dr. Ratin Roy and Dr. Chakravarti Rangarajan to spend about five minutes briefly reacting to what the other panelists have said. I saw uh, Ratin furiously taking down notes and uh, therefore after that what we'll do is we'll throw it open to the audience. I also, uh, my New Year's Eve was also ruined. Uh, I had to listen very carefully to what the Prime Minister was saying and to look for the hidden messages. I had to write an editorial after that, you see. <laughs> Occupational hazards. Okay, Ratin, all yours. Thank you, Parvo. This was a very interesting panel and uh, quite not unexpectedly, I guess. Hello. Yeah. So, no, this, why does this only ever happen in India? Uh, not unexpectedly, I find myself in reasonably complete agreement with Ashima. Uh, but again, and this is important to the headline point I'm going to make in a minute, point out the challenge. I think, if I heard you correctly, what you're saying is the government does need to stimulate consumption. And it can do so in two ways, by ta cutting taxes or alternatively Robin Hood, by raising taxes and then spending that money elsewhere. The raising taxes, you have to take a call on how much they can be raised by, uh, even if you raise tax rates. Our call at an IPFP is not by much. So the 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 you know, the elasticity of tax revenues, most of Indian tax revenues with respect to tax rates, raising them further is not very high. So if you really wanted to become a sort of old-fashioned socialist government and raise taxes as much as possible, you would on a good day be looking at one and a half percentage points of GDP. But that is germane to what I'll come back to later in terms of the cost of benefit. But otherwise I think, on the oil taxes, I want to say I strongly support them. I think this business process of dealing with oil price volatility by using non-fiscal measures is outmoded. The only long-term way you can deal with oil price volatility, uh, let, me, let me use a bit of economic jargon. We know, in, most of us know, that oil prices globally follow a random walk, which means that your best predictor of oil price is today's oil price, which is great news for policymakers because then you don't have to worry about the price. You just set a desired price. And if the price goes above the desired price, then you use other instruments to keep the price where it is. And if the price goes below it, then you tax it up. So keeping, and then of course there are environmental reasons and distributive reasons. Our own research at an IPFP has shown that fuel subsidies were regressive because they largely go to the rich. So taxing petroleum, taxing oil is a good idea. And in fact, I'd have wanted a little more. I'm disappointed. I, I would have pegged oil at $80 a barrel. The government is pegging it at $64 a barrel. So that's my two comments on Ashima and Lakhri Parajoy's point about oil prices also. Uh, my main point, which speaks to what I think all the panelists have been speaking, including Mr. Rajwadi, is this. I think, and very inspired by you, Mr. Bharat, there are, if you look at the theory of fiscal policy, Robin Hood, or whatever you call it, or any kind of equity aspiration you have, there is something called the second theorem of welfare economics, which, I'm, which I keep quoting. The second theorem of welfare economics says that when you have achieved a certain growth rate, if you don't like the distribution, income distribution or consumption distribution associated with that growth rate, then tax the people who you think have too much and give it to the people you think have too little. Don't engage in economic activity. You see what I'm saying? And I did do it to a lump sum tax because tax is a distortion, but never mind all that, to simplify it. So suppose you have attained the GDP now, whatever it is, X, but you don't like the income distribution genie, fine. Then take the income from the people you think have too much and give it to the people below. And you keep doing that, right? That is in fact what informs a welfare state, you know, uh, unemployment benefit and things like that. Those are standard calder Hicks transfers. That's one kind of government you can run. The other kind of government you can run is a Nehruvian government where you don't care about the poor. Please remember that the word poverty did not enter the lexicon of the government of India till 1969. All right, so, and that's when the confusion began. That you do because you want to build up the country. That's very nationalistic. Mr. Modi should be very pleased. Very nationalistic vision. You don't care about 
poor people. I mean, mostly I could ask the question if I really cared about poor people, then are the boundaries of India, you know, the best way to serve them, right? And maybe I should just break up India and the poor would benefit. How do I know? So you, have, you, are all, you also want to be nationalistic. You want to say, I want to maintain the unity and integrity of India. Therefore, what you do is you invest in building up the material de guerre, the means of production of the economy. So you, and therefore, you don't invest necessarily in primary schools. You go for IIT. You go for IIM. You, you subsidize higher education because you want to create smart people who can then compete with smart people elsewhere. So your country is nationalistically big. And then you create a large public sector to go with that. And fine. So somewhere from the 70s, I think what has happened is that the purposes of public finance have been schizophrenic in response to what we're saying. We are unable to decide whether we want a state that needs, that goes Calder Hicks, transfers, no activity, no activity, or an Air India, which is for national reasons, right? This schizophrenia in the central government in particular, in my view, is bankrupting the central government. Because you cannot simultaneously run two competing ideologies, both of which involve public expenditure, and come to a state of affairs which is satisfactory. Let me give you the numbers, and you decide as a group. Pe different people will decide different things. If you look at what we tax you 18% of GDP, and we borrow from you, since I presume you're all savers, 7% of GDP, six to seven. One fourth of GDP is devoted to Calder Hicks plus Nehruvian. Socialism, Air India, one fourth. I'm only talking about this center, center plus states, all right? Health, education, defense, everything. Are you convinced that you want this to be higher at current levels of efficiency? Let's not do motherhood and apple pie. Levels of efficiency are not going to increase when you throw money at a problem. You're all business people, you know that. If you have an inefficient business unit, you do not make it efficient by giving in more money, right? Or do you want to fix the efficiency and then calibrate an expanded state, which I'm actually in favor of, I agree with you, I do believe our problems are, are structural. On that basis, now, I've told you why what I think our structural problem is. I think our structural problem is a political economy problem. We have not yet got a rate of rent seeking, and we are doing these two things at once. So I think that's the fundamental, if you like, foundational question behind economic policy making in India. And I do not think the budget is going to resolve it, which is why I say we must think medium term. I'm not even able to get Niti Aayog to focus on this question. They came to me and said, what should be our vision, Doc? I said, well, if you're going to grow at 8% every five years, double up per capita income, how large do you want the Indian state to be? That's a fundamental question you've got to ask for 2030. Are you happy with 25? You want a 40% state? You want a 20%? Then, should the state be producing or transferring? So I would uh, sort of respond to, I think, a number of things that Shurajit and Mr. Rajwadi said on the basis of that. Or I want to make a quick comment on public debt. Public debt is 68% of GDP. Uh, it, is the, it is more than double that of any emerging economy. And we do not have a number for the public sector borrowing requirement, the PSBR. The PSBR is the number that is traditionally used, including by r and And that is, okay, so if you add that, we'll come to 90% actually. So I'm not saying that that means I can't say anything about this bloody committee, that, that, is, that public debt is high or low or good or bad but just making a factual point. My final point is actually to Shurojit. I mean, partly I've sort of said it in terms of size of the state. But if the Indian economy is contracting for, re for the reasons that you ascribe, that is, there is less aggregate demand, etc. unless you're saying that that aggregate demand is, is lower than it ought to be because of a misalignment of income between those with a higher propensity to consume and those with a lower propensity to consume, which then requires a calendar X transfer, what can fiscal policy do to solve the problem? Uh, it's a genuine question. I'm, I'm not able to, because until I know that, again increasing the size of the 25% state uh, is difficult. So unless we are saying that there's something wrong with the income distribution and people who could consume more are not consuming more because they don't have the incomes to consume more, yeah? Then you can see the state must step in, however decrepit, and take money from those who are not consuming, i.e. saving, and give it, at, and, you're, and, and, and you give it to people who consume more. But if you're doing that, you are also reducing the pool from which your fiscal policy is taking savings. And you're also making the assumption, which I'm all for if you agree with me, that the private sector cannot use domestic savings. If the private sector cannot use domestic savings, at, current, at, at the current price, which is paid by it, then fine, uh, we can reduce saving and increase consumption. So that's my reaction.
Thank you so much, Ruthin, for me. We'll know in a very short while from now, whether on the 1st of February or otherwise, whether Prime Minister Narendra Modi will become, start acting or behaving a little closer to a person whose name he rarely mentions and who he loves to hate, our first Prime Minister Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. Will we see them, you know, morphing into each other? That only time can tell. Meanwhile, I'll request Dr. Rangarajan to make a few observations. Is this working now? Well, I, I think it's time for uh, the audience to make their questions. But uh, I must say that whatever I have listened so far uh, is extremely lively. Uh, from a strictly economic question of whether an expansionary fiscal policy is appropriate at the moment, uh, to the kind of leadership that democracy throws up in not only in India but all over the world, I think we have covered an extensive canvas. I think I, I am not really going into the much broader issues, sociological and others, but uh, let me focus on only a few things that have been said in relation and in the context of the coming budget. Uh, there are uh, larger issues like gender, inclusion and so on, uh, which can be debated, but I am not today going into those things. But let me only uh, answer or express my own views uh, in the context of what has been said uh, in relation to the budget. Well, the, the fact of the slowing of the economy, I think is not in doubt. And I think the, all the numbers indicate and this is whether you look at it in, in value added or value of production, this is not really the critical point. I think the, even the new numbers are now beginning to show that it is, it is a slowing down. Therefore, the need and the imperative to, argue, to accelerate growth is extremely important. The question that really arises is what do we need, do, what do we do in order to accelerate growth? Now, expansionary fiscal policy, I don't rule out. I mean, I think that's one, that is one aspect of it. The other is that unless that private investment also picks up, these, we are not finding a, a, a permanent solution to the problem. I think we really need to see all elements in the, in the system go up. Now, this posing the question as if whether consumption, increase in consumption expenditure is the right thing or the increase in investment expenditure is the right thing, is not also very correct. I mean, in the, in the long run, or not, not in the long run, even in the medium term, it is important. I meant, earlier quoted the acceleration principle. Now, ultimately, investment becomes desirable. Investment is only because the entrepreneurs see there's an increase in demand. Therefore, the, we cannot, I mean, there are countries whether it is sustainable or not, it is very difficult, who have gone on to grow by just increasing consumption expenditure. I mean, what is after all happening in the United States? I mean, in the United States expansion, whatever that you have seen now, is just simply because of the expansion in consumption expenditure. And for that investment, they depend upon somebody else who, who's saving outside the country. I think that is, that is really the problem. But I think, given the current situation, I, I believe that a slightly expansionary fiscal policy is not uh, inadvisable. But I will come back to the budget deficit. I mean, it is not inadvisable. I, I think the efficiency question reminds always, I mean, this is not a new question. Efficiency question about public investment is there. But how exactly the capital expenditure is incurred is, is, is a problem. I think just using the word capital expenditure doesn't really do the trick. Because in the government of India, the word capital expenditure does not mean investment. If, you, if the government gives a loan to somebody, it is also capital expenditure. Therefore, capital expenditure is not synonymous with uh, investment or creation of fiscal capital. Now let me come to fiscal deficit. I think whenever we argue about fiscal deficit, then 
you, you describe them as fundamentalists. I think this is wrong. I think the idea of fiscal prudence or fiscal deficit, having a rule about it, is not a bad idea. In fact, as I mentioned, Rajwada was not present. If there are no rules relating to fiscal deficit, budget making is the easiest thing in the world. All that you have to do is say, these are my expenditures, this is all what I get, I will borrow it. Therefore, could you say that there is no limit to borrowing is also not correct. And I must also say that we have been the most lax as far as the budget deficit is concerned. We have never been strict about it. I think there is only one year in which we went very close to 3%. In 2008, people forget the central government's fiscal deficit was 7% of GDP. The central government alone. And that is what finally landed us also in the high inflation uh, uh, period. Therefore, I am not arguing that there is a fixed number to which you should always gravitate. That is not the point. But there must be some idea of where we go. Now, for example, the distinction is, I mean, my committee suggested to do away with the plan and non-plan expenditures. And the correct way to look at it is a revenue and capital. Capital as well defined, not the capital expenditure of the, the government of India, is the correct thing. There was one principle of fiscal deficit, which was the golden rule, which was adopted in UK and others. Namely, your revenue deficit must be zero, and you can have as much of a fiscal deficit as you want, so long as it is matched by capital expenditures. That is a, the golden rule. One can do that. But I must repeatedly say, I must repeat what I have said before, in India, throughout, Whenever the budget the fiscal deficit has gone up, it is not because of capital expenditures or investment. It has always been because of increase in consumption expenditure. Last year also, it is the seventh uh, pay commission and so on. Therefore, the distinction between capital and revenue is critical. I think we should fo focus very clearly on capital expenditures as a lever to accelerate growth. And we can adjust the fiscal deficit concept to suit this, I think. But then, we must, as I mentioned earlier, the fiscal deficit that we are not talking about is 3%. I mean, 3% is only one number as far as the government of India is. And if uh, the central government gives away more by, say, up to 42% or whatever it is, to the state government, the state government's def the deficit comes down. Therefore, taken together, it has been hovering around 6% of the fiscal deficit of the GDP. It is double what the Maastricht Treaty has said. Maastricht Treaty of 3% was for all levels of government. Now this is about 6%. 6% again is not a true 6%. Sometimes you are hiding it under various heads and so on and so forth. Therefore I would say, yes, in the current year, I am not really saying that you should stick to the 3% which has been uh, as a roadmap. But the very fact that roadmaps are being given every year shows how flexible we are on that. 12th Finance Commission gave a roadmap. 13th Finance Commission gave a roadmap. Now Rajin Rice Committee will give another roadmap. Now, if you go on revising your roadmaps, where is the, where is the rigidity about this? It is a highly flexible, non-binding, a kind of a, an arrangement that we have. But I do believe that fiscal prudence is important. If you run, if you move away from fiscal prudence, you can't run into a, a problems of different sort. So all that I'm saying to, today for this, uh, for, this year, uh, for this morning is, yes, given the situation where economy is stagnating, and given the need that the private corporate investment is not picking up and therefore the stimulus has to come from the government. Yes, there is a case for an expanded government expenditure. But also at the same time, please, as I mentioned earlier, believe that if you push the fiscal deficit more and more, then don't expect the private investment to come. There is only a certain given amount of pool at any given point in time in terms of savings. If you take away more of that savings by the government, then at the same time don't expect that private corporate investment will also pick up. So that is the contradiction. 
So that is, uh, therefore, in terms of, I mean, uh, I, on demonetization, I said a few things earlier. Uh, I don't want to repeat them. Therefore, I believe that an expansionary fiscal policy within limits is an acceptable proposition, but I think the limit also must be taken in the context of uh, the stability of parameters. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rangarajan, for outlining so clearly, so lucidly, the areas of agreement as well as the areas of disagreement. If we didn't disagree, you know, then we wouldn't have been argumentative Indians. You know, and uh, Mr. Modi, uh, when Coldplay was playing here in the Bandra Kulla complex, he said, come fathers and mothers throughout the land, don't criticize what you can't understand. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. The order is rapidly changing. I'm reminded of another few lines, concluding lines of my back pages by Nobel laureate Robert Zimmerman, better known as Bob, Bob Dylan. Good and bad, I defined these terms as if so clear somehow. Ah, but I was so much older then. I'm younger than that now. It's now, floor is open to all of you. Uh, I, I have a few suggestions, please. What we'll do is we'll take a few questions at a time, say three or four questions, and maybe we can have two or three rounds of questioning. My request to the questioners, please do identify yourself, sir, and we would appreciate if your comments are brief and your questions are pointed, and if you wish to address any particular person in the panel, you should feel free to do that. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Uday Khanna. Uh, you know, one issue which has not been touched in the need for resources is the issue of larger tax base. I think Professor Shimangoel mentioned about it, this whole issue of a huge variety of people, including agriculture, outside the tax base. What is the view of the panel on what can we do? Because that will expand the base and then you probably have more resources. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, let me take that lady over there, the two ladies. I'll come back to you, sir. Yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Tulsi Jaikumar. I'm from uh, SPJN, Professor of Economics. My question is to Professor Mazumdar. Um, you spoke about the need for an expansionary fiscal policy. As Dr. Angarajan has been speaking about, it leads to a crowding out effect. Now, uh, my question to you is, uh, and I was speaking to Dr. Roy just before that, have you taken into account the fact that there is a multiplier accelerator and the fact that the multiplier itself would have likely gone down now with the MPC? So what is the kind of extent of uh, uh, you know, fiscal deficit that would be required. And in fact, it turns out to be more of a revenue deficit rather than a fiscal deficit. We've been speaking about fiscal deficit. What, what are your comments on that? Okay. Uh, I'll come back to you, madam. The gentleman right at the front. So, thank you, sir. A Vivek Pity of Harinagar Sugar Mills. Sir, one of the stated objectives for demonetization was to reduce corruption and consequently black money. But as I find that post-demonetization uh, and even including the speech of the Honorable Prime Minister on 31st December, mighty little has been done to propose or take any steps or any structural changes in the system which would lead to reduction in corruption, except for uh, just uh, the Prime Minister opening a public debate on the political system and election process, which to my knowledge, ultimately was not going to lead to any conclusive decisions which ultimately reduce corruption at bureaucratic levels as well as political levels. And we all know one of the main reasons for black money is to meet these needs of corruption, be it in bureaucratic levels or political levels. Is the political corruption. I think uh, Dr. Rangarajan me mentioned it very briefly in yeah. his speech, but that's an important point. Yeah. You made Vivekji, anything else? No, that's okay. Thanks. Uh, we, there are lots and lots of hands, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two more questions and then go to the panel and I'll come back to all of you. Uh, yes, please. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay so, I'll tell you what. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so this is a question for Dr. Roy. D so, do, do identify yourself. Uh, yeah, my name is Sumit Banerjee, I'm from the chamber. This is a question for Dr. Roy. Uh, in your uh, address in the morning, 
you mentioned uh, in passing uh, in the context of auto sales and numbers etc uh, that uh, if before 8th november um, economy was growing due to bad things uh, then probably after 8th november it might grow for good things so if you could just amplify on that a little bit it will be helpful. okay uh, we'll take one more question from mr ravi dukkal uh, and then we'll get the panel to respond and then i'll go for another round of questions please yeah uh, i have a question which anybody can answer is i would like to hear uh, more on uh, what has been the impact of demonetization on the informal economy there was some mention but i think i would like to know more because uh, uh, one does see a fairly large impact because this whole economy is based on cash transactions and uh, what we are doing in the process is we are painting the entire informal economy with a black brush okay and, thank uh, you sir uh, uh, so so i think uh, just to give an example of what is happening at the ground level is that i spoke to my vegetable vendor you know and in the corner uh, of the street i live in and he says that his sales has gone down by 50 to 60% so how is he coping you know we are gate at jugar in this country so in fact what is being facilitated actually is the expansion of the black economy so he gets 30000 rupees from somebody into his bank account and he gets a 10% cut on that this is very common practice which you see and i am being pushed to go to the mall because i don't have cash to buy vegetables which is going to destroy the informal economy okay thank you thank you would like to start off mr rajwadi would you like to react to some of the points uh, the questions or the comments that have been made i mean two were addressed in very general terms the one on issue of corruption and black money and the issue of widening the tax base would you like to respond sir and then we, we can sort of go from right to left okay ashima yes it's working yeah. uh Yes, I think uh, both these points are are really relevant as uh, long-term possible gains from demonetization. One is the issue of expanding the tax base, because uh, <clears throat> there's it's part of big data. You know, this is given a lot of should have given a lot of information to tax authorities, and in general, the consumption items. And uh, we are seeing an era of big data where the government has a lot of data on what individuals do. So that has to be used effectively to ensure that more people come in the tax base, and then measures that reduce the generation of black money are also linked. and this includes uh, agricultural income because that is a big loophole beyond some threshold perhaps agricultural income should be taxed if informal sector moves to more digital there's more data then there are positives and negatives one they have to pay tax in fact in the rbi the view was that the rise in cash in the last two years is partly because service tax had risen and people were moving to ta cash transactions to escape service tax but uh, uday kotak was giving a talk at our institute and he was saying that um, we'll have more data on the informal sector then we can lend more to smes yeah uh, if they are going to come into the digital economy so there are positives there also there are other measures that can be done to reduce sources of black political funding of course also real estate registration reducing stamp duties so the point i made briefly was tax not just tax cuts but tax rationalization simplification removing these loopholes and reducing rates and i hope this budget will build on that's building on pop, potential positive long term effects of demonetizing we all know there are huge short term costs okay all right uh, we have uh, dr roy is asking you know we don't measure in mumbai uh, distances anymore we measure it by time so he has a flight to catch and so what we'll do is uh, i think maybe you should re uh, respond to the question that was specifically raised to you and maybe what i could do is before he parts ways i'll i'll ask him what the committee has recommended and surely he will duck that question therefore if there are some specific questions for him we'll take it and then we'll continue our discussion yes please uh, uh, uh you have only one you you have already a specific question okay uh, yes you have any question specifically yeah. specifically for dr rathin roy yeah. okay yes please sir specific question for you Oh. now we had this demonetization and we are likely to have 
the GST being rolled out. Both the steps are supposed to be disruptive. If they are disruptive, then there is, has to be some view on the uh, expectation that we have about GDP in nominal terms and tax collection. So do you feel that the budget will take into account uh, all these disruptions or we are going to go ahead as things as usual? Because both the disruptions, every time GST has been introduced anywhere, things have slowed down a little bit. All right. So would you like to also just identify yourself? My name is Siddhartha Roy from the Tata Group. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roy. Uh, uh, quickly, please, because he has to leave. Uh, we'll, we'll go to the lady first and then my old friend Rajrishi at the back. Please go on. Sure. Thank you, sir. So I'm Kaneka Pasricha, economist with Stan Chart. The question that I have is that, uh, first from an econo economist viewpoint, if you look at the bal various balance sheets in Indian economy, today the corporate balance sheet is stressed, banking sector balance sheet is also stressed, and household incomes are not growing. So it's the onus then comes on the government to do something for growth to actually pick up in this economy. From that standpoint, if you look at the budget, while fiscal consolidation is prudent given our elevated debt levels, but is it that we are too hung up on uh, pleasing the rating agencies as well, given that our calculations suggest if we target fiscal deficit at 3% of GDP in FI18, unless the tax base changes substantially, there could be a budgeting of a substantial contraction in CAPEX spending. <coughs> given the structural right, revenue spending component. Thank you, Kanika Ji, for that question. My doctor has advised me to avoid stress. I'm, I'm trying very hard, not very successfully, I must confess. Uh, Rajrishi. Yeah, thank you, Paranjay. Uh, my name is Rajrishi Singhal. Uh, we discussed uh, about, you know, the orthodoxy regarding fiscal deficit. Um, but we haven't discussed uh, the orthodoxy regarding uh, what is revenue expenditure and what is capital expenditure. This is a bit like the binary discussion on revenue foregone because every year there is a discussion on how revenue foregone is considered as uh, money down the drain or as a giveaway whereas actually it's a kind of an incentive to uh, promote industrialization not all of it is a giveaway not all of it is lobby led or uh, not all of it is due to cronism uh, likewise uh, there has been no public discussion on what should be revenue expenditure and what should be capital expenditure. And can we have a, uh, you know, some discussion on that at least? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajrishi. Rathin, uh, your, it's all yours before you start flying across Worli to Bandra. <coughs> Thank you. I'm an optimist. I still think it will only take me 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what I'm trying to flag to you, I think the first question on auto sales. What I'm trying to flag to you is my reading of the political ideology the economic political ideology of the Prime Minister particularly in this one dimension, which is that there is a huge dissatisfaction with the outcomes of our growth process and what he's trying to say is that if our growth process such as it is, is measured by auto sales, then since most Indians don't buy cars, it means that most Indians are not, most Indians consumption is not being benefited by incremental growth. So what he wants is the contradictions in this, but he wants the he wants to see a change in where the growth is generated by promoting the consumption of the of, by promoting consumption of what poor people can consume, which will be probably speculating good news for Hindustan Lever, good news for cycle companies, bad news for Bharati. Now, of course, it's more complicated than that, but because a, a large basket of what uh, poor people consume, if you look at the Prime Minister's statement when he came to power, happened to be public goods. So then there's a different role for government. So that's what I was trying to get at. That, that is the aspiration. Now, I think the question that Mr. Roy asked is a very difficult one. Budgets are not the right instrument to deal with disruptions. Uh, because then the assumption is that by, by basically what is a budget? You can spend more or tax less, right? Uh, and if the problem, if the disruption is solved by spending more or taxing less, then by all means the budget is an instrument. In the second sense that if you take demonetization and GST, the former, according to the government of India, has a positive impact on the budget because it's expected to raise tax revenues, right? We shall see. The latter, that is GST, the problem is not, the problem is a very peculiar one. GST as a whole will be revenue. Let's assume that people have done their job correctly. But the states that gain will not compensate the states that lose, and therefore the center has to pay 
for this reform by compensating the states that lose. Their demonetization has created a problem because now the states are saying that our, we, our, our idea of what our own tax revenue is itself has become volatile. So therefore, even if we lose tax revenue on non-GST counts, you must compensate us. So that is going to be a major conundrum. It's not an accountancy conundrum. I don't know what's going to happen to it. If the, if, now the question that you asked, I think, from Stanchart is very germane. I don't know where you got the idea of CapEx because the government of India's CapEx, as Dr. Angarajan has been repeatedly saying, is marginal. So if, if you really wanted to improve, I mean, I have a larger problem with that. If you really wanted the government to step in and do CapEx, you should be advocating that we raise the fiscal deficit limits for the states to 4.5% if you want. So one, the aggregate limit, as he's been pointing out repeatedly, to whose limit do I raise? Why should I raise the central government's limit? Why not the state governments? Just because we sit in Delhi and Bombay, we can't forget this. Second is, I really object to this government is mummy. Government is not mummy. What I mean is, my balance sheet is stressed, I'm, I'm failing in school, so private sector is bad, households are bad, mummy will solve everything. Mummy is the sum of its parts. Ultimately, household savings and household consumption will leave, give you taxation and borrowing space. That can then be used in the economy, and in the short term, Perhaps the government can step in and others fail. But if, as Shurujit is saying, I agree with him, and Dr. Nagaraj is saying, the problem is structure, then mummy can't do anything. We have to solve the problem where it exists. Final question on RevEx and CapEx. I think Dr. Nagarajan's committee has looked at this. I myself have written on the subject at some length. Very briefly speaking, the revenue expenditure part, what we classify as consumption expenditure, the one item there that is controversial is grants given by the central government to state governments for creating capital assets. Those must continue to be booked as revenue expenditure because the central government does not own the assets, one. And two, nobody is asking the central government to play daddy and give capital asset grants to the states. So if they're taking that decision, they're taking it for some reason. But they're not the asset holders. So it's bad accounting practice to create, to treat a grant that's not. The second is the question of what is below the line uh, in the IMF classification. And that has more to do with the classification of capital expenditure. Broadly speaking, I would say revenue expenditure 90% captures what uh, consumption expenditure in India is. So if you reduce it by 10%, also it is too much. And broadly speaking, CapEx maybe underestimates by 5 or 10%. And then the other point is very important, Dr. Nagarajan said, whether the government is undertaking financial investment or gross fixed capital formation. So what you don't want to see is more and more money going into Air India, uh, which shouldn't be there in the first place, and uh, less and less money going into real things. Now on real things, on GFCF, government is merchant banker. We've seen it for years. Government is doing leverage 6x. So you create the NIF, you put 20,000 crores in, then you appoint the fund manager and say, create 5x. That's what the government has been doing with the PPP model and with this model. Government has not been the prime mover of GFCA, which is what will give you that investment growth payback that you need. Thank you. All right, I'm sure what he said uh, can be contested and debated, but we'll have to wait for another occasion whether or not the Maharaja should exist or not exist, whether Air India should exist or not exist. Anyway, uh, we wish him all the best uh, as he flies across the Bandra, uh, sorry, Whirly Bandra ceiling. And to paraphrase uh, a very popular song, Mama kehte hai, bara naam karega, beta mera bahut kaam karega. Thank you so much, Dr. Roy, for helping us out and being participating in this discussion. And uh, we'll continue our discussion and bid him farewell for the time being. Uh, let, let me ask uh, some of the other panelists to react. You also want to go, sir? I need to. You need to go. You want to leave right away, sir? Okay. Would you like to say something by way of a concluding remark? Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, we're having another panelist, Dr. Rajwade, uh, Mr. Rajwade, who wants to leave us. So once again, let me thank you so much, Mr. Rajwade, for your presence here and your very perceptive comments. So, so let me now get both uh, Surajit and uh, Ashok into our conversation. Yes, please. Well, let me try and uh, clarify some of the things I was going to say in the process of responding to the questions and points that have come up. Uh, let me kind of draw attention of everyone to the fact that Professor Ang uh, Dr. Angrajan was referring to the question of private investment. Uh, Ratin earlier referred to the absence of cycle. But private corporate investment is something in which you can definitely see a cycle. There is a process where you have phases of very rapid growth of private corporate investment and 
a slum of the kind that we are seeing today. So there is a cyclical movement which we first have to try and understand why is that cycle being uh, seen uh, and uh, what's, what's actually causing that particular problem. You also see that this particular pattern of private corporate investment has a very strong correlation with the pattern of manufacturing investment for the simple reason that manufacturing is the sector which accounts for a significant part of capital formation. Uh, and for the private corporate sector also, apart from infrastructure, this is the, really the key sector of uh, investment. So you see this particular pattern. Now, the question I'd like to pose is, why do you get this, uh, 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 why should you not expect this to happen when your other indicators are indicating that the trend in the Indian economy is of deindustrialization? Roderick has put India into the category of countries which are experiencing premature deindustrialization. That is, we've never had a full fledged industrialization process, and yet we are deindustrializing insofar as the importance of manufacturing, both in employment and output in the economy, is relatively shrinking. Now, what would explain this particular process? So, there I, was, I would suggest that there is a problem in the nature of the demand pattern that is being generated within the Indian economy. So if you have consumption expenditure growing, if you look at the composition of the demand that is where it is being spent, you find that the proportion which is going on services is increasing, that which is going towards manufacturing is actually coming down, which has to be explained by the way the income is getting distributed and the way it is getting spent, because a large part of Indians would tend to purchase more manufactured products if their incomes were to increase. So there is a st structural problem there. If you do not also have demand coming from the external sector, and you do not have demand being generated by government expenditure, then essentially you are in a situation where investment in manufacturing, which is also a manufacturing intensive expenditure, investment is a highly manufacturing intensive expenditure, you are in a situation where manufacturing investment has to generate its own demand. But manufacturing investment also creates manufacturing capacity. And therefore, you are running into the problem that you simply don't have enough demand to sustain that kind of an investment process. Therefore, you see this cyclical pattern. Now, if these problems have to be addressed, I am suggesting fiscal policy by now talking about expansionary fiscal policy. I am not suggesting that they just go run right and spend on anything. What I am saying is that fiscal policy, and by that I mean both the taxation as well as the expenditure sites, both have to be seen as instruments of addressing the structural imbalances which are causing this. So it is not something to be just a policy to be taken now, it is to be seen in terms of a longer term strategy as the kind Ratin was talking about. In that context, I'd like to make a brief point about the tax base question. Yes, it is true that our tax base is narrow if we talk only about direct taxes. But a substantial part of our taxes come from indirect taxes. The base of that is actually much wider. And the problem is we rely too much on indirect taxes relative to direct taxes. So that's also one of the structural uh, problems that we have to actually address. And I do not think, while it is true that uh, the, the, those who pay direct taxes, the number is very small, I do not think that the numbers who are actually within the so-called tax net, that there are no issues about inadequate tax mobilization even from within them. That is only outside that particular thing. So the question of the tax base is, we actually have a wider tax base. Maybe we should have it narrower and ensure that we get more from uh, direct taxes. Okay, thank you, Shurujit. Ashok, you'd like to make any comments? I just want to add to this uh, question of tax base. I think the GST, the way it is structured, is going to bring about a much greater integration between the direct tax base and the indirect tax base. Because the way the registration is going to happen, that the PAN card is going to be an integral element of the entire registration process. So willy-nilly, you will have a situation where actually, with the use of technology, it will be possible for the government to create, at the gross margin level, the p &L of every GST service provider, GST registration holder, at the gross margin level. Because you know exactly what you're buying, at what price, and you know exactly what you're selling, and the quantities are available, so therefore, with a suitable supercomputer, you can actually have the PNL at the gross margin level available. With adequate bandwidth. Huh? With adequate bandwidth. With adequate bandwidth. 
So that's, that's one part, I think, where the tax base is willy-nilly going to increase. Bringing the agricultural, this thing is, again, I think it's a political question. I don't think it will get addressed that soon. So I'm, I'm reasonably confident about that happening. Uh, that's, that's a comment that I wanted to make. Thank you.